are undoubtedly birds, but which cannot fly. Birds of paradox. Flight is the essence of a bird. Powered by wings, they fly free from earthbound dangers. Powered by wings, they seek and take their food. Through the air, they travel hundreds of miles to breed, to find shelter, to survive the hardships of winter. Their lives transformed by the magic of flight. thousand species of birds in the world today, but about one in a hundred of them has forsaken the power of flight. Flightless birds, almost a contradiction in terms. These strange paradoxical creatures have feathers, they have beaks, they lay eggs just like conventional birds. They even have wings of a sort, though useless for raising them from the ground. Is it possible that the present-day masters of the air are descended from the same ancestor as these plodding, earthbound creatures? that all birds, flying and flightless, share a common ancestor. And here's the evidence, Archaeopteryx. Half reptile, half bird, it lived in Central Europe 140 million years ago. We know of its existence only from some half dozen fossil specimens discovered in a limestone quarry in Bavaria. Here's what Archaeopteryx must have looked like. About the size of a crow, it seems to have been descended from one of the small, ground-running dinosaurs, and so was a genuine missing link between reptiles and birds. It may well have started to fly by using its wing-like forelimbs to help it run and jump in search of insect food. Archaeopteryx still had the teeth and the claws and the long tail of its reptilian ancestors. But it had already made the principal change, reptile scales into feathers. It even had asymmetrical flight feathers like a modern flying bird and the beginnings of the finely tuned brain needed for flight. This is actually part of an Archaeopteryx brain. The earliest bird had taken to the air but to tell the story of the birds that returned to Earth, we move forward millions of years to the tales of the Arabian Nights. Lo, there appeared a white dome of enormous size, its circumference full 50 paces. And behold, the sky became dark. It was a great bird that veiled the sun. And I remembered the rock 
a bird so huge that it feedeth its young with elephants. Now when the merchants landed, they struck the egg with stones, whereupon it broke and the young appeared within. So they killed it and took from it abundance of meat. And when the rock came, it cried with a voice more vehement than thunder and threw down a boulder so that our ship was crushed. The real life bird which gave rise to the rock legend was huge, but certainly didn't fly, Epiornis. Now extinct, it did lay a very large egg, even if not 50 paces round. But it was in fact the largest bird's egg ever. An Epiornis egg weighing more than 20 pounds is the equivalent of 183 chicken eggs. Yet this earthbound monster, along with its flightless cousins, still retained the sophisticated brain and the fused wing and tail bones evolved for flight, showing that its ancestors had been flying birds. But once flight was abandoned, Epiornis grew to a vast size. The leg bone of a chicken and the equivalent bone from Epiornis. Like the legendary rock, Epiornis lived on the island of Madagascar. The larger species must have weighed nearly a thousand pounds, the equivalent of three ostriches, the heaviest bird ever known. No wonder it's also called the elephant bird. Ten centuries have passed since it was hunted out by local tribesmen, but its relatives flourish. These are called ratites birds which have a flat breastbone like a raft. A flying bird has a breastbone with a keel to which flight muscles are attached. The raft-like ratite sternum is almost flat, affording poor anchorage for muscles. Modern ratites like ostriches, emus, and rheas all share this feature. The breastbone we're most familiar with belongs to the domestic hen. Its strong keel reminds us that despite our efforts to fatten it up, the hen is still a flying bird. Its feathers show this too. The chick's soft, fluffy plumage is useful for keeping warm, useless for flying. The adult hen not only develops warm body feathers with centrally placed spines, but also strong wing feathers with the spines off-center, flight feathers of the same design as those in the Archaeopteryx wing. Ratite birds, on the other hand, retain throughout their lives the fluffy plumage these youngsters will lose. So how is it that ratites today are flourishing throughout the world in all sorts of habitats? To find out, we need to stop the Earth's clock, then run time backwards at fantastic speed. The surface of the globe is constantly moving and changing. The huge plates which form its crust drift like rafts on its molten interior. This is how it must have looked 160 million years ago. Now to discover the origins of the ratite birds, we need to tilt this ancient world over to show an area we now think of as Antarctica. In fact, this huge continent known as Gondwana land was much bigger than the Antarctic since land masses such as modern Australia, New Guinea, and South America were linked to it. Gondwana land was, it's believed, the home of the early ratites, the ancestors of many of our modern flightless birds. Then over a period of millions of years, the continent of Gondwana land gradually split up. Groups of ratites found themselves sailing away on their individual Noah's arcs of land to new positions on the globe and totally isolated from their place of origin. Here in widely differing habitats and climates, ratites evolved in response to the varying demands of their new environments. In Africa, they became ostriches living on open plains. In the forest of Madagascar, massive elephant birds. Cassowaries evolved in the rainforest of Australia and New Guinea. Emus in the more open habitats. New Zealand ratite descendants range from towering moas to tiny kiwis. While the plains of South America have given rise to the rhea, 
Not all these ratites have survived, but despite the disadvantages of flightlessness, most have been surprisingly successful. The ostrich is typical of these birds of paradox. But on the African plains, an area densely populated with predators of all kinds, how is it possible for a flightless bird to survive? First, by sheer size. The ostrich is the largest living bird, up to nine feet tall and weighing as much as 345 pounds, an unlikely meal for even the most powerful of predators. This huge size is valuable in another way, too. Flat open plains are the scene of the ostrich's very public, private life, and the body signals of other individuals can be clearly seen at great distances. Another major asset is speed. It's been clocked at up to 35 miles an hour. Indeed, the fastest animal on two legs. This is valuable for evading danger, but important in other ways, too. At breeding time, the male ostrich seeks to drive off every male and mate with every female in his territory. And then there's the ostrich's excellent eyesight. Superb vision from a great height gives the ostrich a first-class view of everything going on, almost as good as if it were hovering in the air. Male and female take turns incubating the eggs, a particularly vulnerable time for a flightless bird. The female's brown plumage provides good camouflage during the day. The black-feathered male takes over at night. The ostrich egg itself is something of a paradox. The largest of any living bird, yet one of the smallest eggs compared with the size of the adult. At three pounds, only one and a half percent of the mother's weight. Some of the eggs and chicks this female is carrying for are her own, and some are those of other hens, who have mated with the same male, then laid in the same nest. Why should she care for another bird's eggs? There's a good reason, as we shall see. Another strategy by which the earthbound bird defends its offspring. Dangers can come from any direction. Some approach from the ground, others from the air flying and flightless bird in confrontation. A clutch left unattended instantly attracts the Egyptian vulture, which has its own special technique for getting to work on an egg, even when its shell is a quarter of an inch thick. This shows the benefit of having other birds' eggs in the nest. Eggs on the edge are more likely to be attacked, leaving the hen's own eggs safer in the center. Ostrich chicks are very small when they hatch, but surprisingly self-sufficient. Their rate of growth is very rapid. In nine months, they'll be as large as their parents and able to run as fast. The ostrich parents are already guarding a mixed family, chicks from one father probably, but several mothers. Now an even stranger event is about to take place. Parents from several broods meet and take part in an extraordinary display. Male displays to male, female to female, capering and cavorting on powerful legs, dipping and trailing their long, elegant plumes. At the conclusion, one pair will have taken over all the young ostriches to bring them up as their own, another strategy to spread the risks. There's safety in numbers. Even so, a year later, only 15% of the chicks will remain, 
but as powerful, formidable birds, well able to succeed in this highly competitive habitat. and other ratites gave up flight in favor of a land-bound way of life. Other birds have taken to the water. The great auk, for example, became completely flightless. Sadly, this made it too convenient as a source of food for sailors. On June 4, 1844, on an island off southwest Iceland, the last two adults were killed and their single egg smashed. The great auk was extinct. Its close relatives, the razor bills, along with other auks, have made a compromise. They swim in the water, but they still fly as well, though their flight seems heavy and cumbersome. In the water, they seem totally at home. Their short, strong wings are used for propulsion, their feet for steering. Once a year, razorbills molt all their flight feathers at the same time. And so for a period, they too become flightless. The steamer duck does something different. Steamers are diving ducks, ruggedly built with massive bills. They seek their food, mostly a variety of mollusks, on the seabed. Three of the four species don't fly. In the fourth species, the lighter females fly, but about a quarter of the males are simply too heavy to fly at any time. The rest of the males can just about get into the air, if they haven't eaten. Truly, this is a bird on the very edge of flightlessness. But there's something else about these ducks which is quite remarkable, their unique form of locomotion. They were named steamers after Mississippi paddle boats. These are white-headed steamer ducks, a newly described species living on the coast of Argentina. Most of their propulsion comes from their large feet, but when diving, the wings help to direct their course. The wings are surprisingly powerful for a flightless bird, but are quite inadequate for raising it into the air. For a steamer duck, that's a major flight. It's when the bird needs to evade a predator or in a territorial dispute that the wings really come into their own. The duck rows with its wings, at the same time kicking vigorously with its feet.
penguins are the world's largest family of completely flightless birds. On land, they're figures of fun. It's been said that penguins cannot run and fly even worse. But the features which make them comical and endearing to us are actually adaptations for swimming. Their flippers have skeletons of the same basic pattern as the wings of flying birds, but they're strengthened and flattened to fly in the heavier medium of water. The short legs placed at the rear of the body give them a stance like plump, pompous little people, but they'll be used as rudders once the penguins enter the ocean. Penguins are a highly successful group, and they're not just birds of snow and ice. The 18 species range from the ice shelf of the Antarctic to the equator. These are a daily penguins. Each year, they travel back across the sea ice to breed at this same nest site, a journey of perhaps 60 miles. Within the tightly packed colony, beaks and flippers are used in aggression. But how do penguins cope with predators bent on their slaughter? Porpoising, plunging in and out of the sea, enables them to keep moving at a good speed without pausing to take an aim. These dramatic leaps are a response to the Adelie's major predator, the powerful leopard seal which can swallow a penguin in a single gulp. On land, the adult penguins have little to fear. The chief predator of eggs and chicks is the skewer. Once more, the flying bird against the flightless. Nests around the edge of the rookery are especially vulnerable to these marauders. But many chicks do survive and prosper to follow their parents into the penguin's proper sphere, the ocean. For though we refer to penguins as flightless, they have never ceased to fly. They simply fly underwater instead. The stocky, comical figure is now seen as streamlined and graceful hovering in the water as its cousin the albatross does in the air, a true master of flight.
penguins, like ostriches, gave up flight and acquired a very special skill. Another group of birds has given up flight because it became unnecessary. Birds that live on islands. On the Galapagos Islands, crabs and iguanas share their island home with flightless cormorants. These cormorants once had powerful wings, but on this equatorial island, there are no predators to evade. Food is plentiful in the rich seas all around. Flight is unnecessary. Flight is an extremely expensive activity in terms of energy. Birds have the highest metabolic rates of all vertebrates. To achieve flight, the skeleton has been modified and lightened. Teeth have been discarded, even sex organs reduced. When flight ceases to be vital for food, safety and reproduction, it's swiftly abandoned. Almost half a world away from the flightless cormorant lives the flightless teal. Its home is on Auckland, a small island well beyond the southernmost tip of New Zealand. These attractive little ducks are following the same path as the Galapagos cormorant. They are already almost flightless. Though they can fly short distances, their wings are quite small, and the teal uses them chiefly to help scramble among the outcrops of rock. They pass their time dibbling peacefully among the kelp beds. In the forests of the island of New Caledonia, 750 miles east of Australia, lives the kagu, a bizarre and little-known bird which seems to have no close relatives. Its flying is limited to gliding between the dense vegetation in its woodland home. But basically, it lives on the ground. It finds its food among the leaf litter. It nests on the ground. And here, too, it performs strange displays of courtship and aggression. Again, the kagu has little need to fly. But there's one whole family of birds which shows a marked tendency to go flightless, the rails. Indeed, of all living birds, they're the most likely to abandon flight. The flying species, shown here by dots, are widely distributed, while the many flightless species, the red dots, are found on islands, or rather were, for many of them have recently become extinct. With the coming of man and his camp followers, cats and rats, pigs and goats, to their island refuges, the rails' earthbound way of life became impossible. Their names now read like a roll call of extinction. Diefenbach's rail, wiped out by introduced cats and rats, extinct. Chatham Island rail, lingered on until about 1900, extinct. Henderson Island Creek, its island home is currently under threat. Tahitian rail destroyed by rats, extinct. Wake Island rail eaten by occupying Japanese soldiers in World War II, extinct. The case of the rail that lived on Ascension Island is typical. On June 7, 1656, the traveler Peter Mundy anchored here and sketched what he called a strange kind of fowl. It had, he said, dainty meat like a roasting pig. Discovered, tasted, exterminated. The ascension rail was never seen again. But one very remarkable rail is still with us. It lives here on the well-named Inaccessible Island. How quickly can a rail lose flight? Because a young rail's flight equipment develops at such a late stage, the change can be very rapid, probably generations rather than millennia. And this little rail has progressed a long way from being a flying bird. This is an adult, but its tiny chick-like wings now have primitive claws to help it clamber in the tussock grass. And its plumage has changed to hardly resemble feathers at all. It's more like hair. This must be the ultimate flightless bird. And for the moment, it's safe. Not so the little laysan rail so confiding it would jump onto your knee, wiped out by rats from a stranded ship in World War II. 
This unique film, shot in 1926, is a pathetic souvenir of this friendly little bird. Happily, the story is not one of unrelieved gloom. As recently as 1981, in one of the densely populated islands of Japan, a totally new species of rail was discovered. Flightless like its cousins, and filmed here for the first time. Yambaruquina, the Okinawa rail. is the bird which is the emblem of extinction, the dodo, discovered on the island of Mauritius in the late 16th century and wiped out within 50 years. The adults were killed for food. Pigs destroyed the nests. With the dodo died its closest relative, the solitaire, and other fascinating species. The dodo was a large turkey-like bird. As large as swans, said a Dutch traveler in 1598, with large heads and a kind of hood thereon. No wings, but three or four black little pens. Sketches from the time show us, for example, that the dodo experienced extreme seasonal changes in weight. This gaunt dodo has molted its feathers and also its bill sheath. These drawings show that the bill seems to have become increasingly ridged as the bird got older. But one basic thing about dodos remains a mystery. What did they eat? Most things, probably, since several dodos survived long voyages to Europe. But all we know is that they digested their food with the help of a gizzard stone. Today, three centuries after the death of the last dodo, this is all that remains of a fascinating and lovable bird. This actual specimen was a living dodo when taken to London about 1638. Sir Heyman Lestrange described it this way. As I walked London streets, I saw the picture of a strange fowl hung out upon a cloth, and myself with one or two more went and didn't see it. It was kept in a chamber, and it was a great fowl, somewhat bigger than the largest turkey cock, but stouter and of more erect shape. The keeper called it a dodo. On its death, the stuffed bird was displayed in a museum until 1755 when the skin was destroyed because it was moth-eaten. Happily, the head and feet were kept, but the last preserved dodo had gone. But in a way, it lingers on. It was again this very specimen and the story of its destruction that inspired Lewis Carroll to include the dodo in Alice a strange extinct bird from a distant island, now such a familiar part of our culture. Not all birds are so well remembered. When in 1839 this bone was brought to the famous anatomist Professor Richard Owen by a visitor from New Zealand, he conjectured daringly that it came from an unknown bird larger than an ostrich. How right he was. It was a bone of a moa, the tallest bird that ever lived, like the ostrich, a ratite. Moas were common in New Zealand when the first Polynesians arrived there a thousand years ago. Moa was their name for chicken, so they transferred the name to this 10-foot flightless hen. Archaeological evidence shows that the moa 
formed a substantial part of the Polynesians' diet until they exterminated it. When Europeans arrived in New Zealand, they were amazed to find deposits of huge bones. This photograph of 1896 excavations shows moa leg bones stacked up like firewood. More scientific techniques are shown in this Canterbury Museum film of the 1960 excavations in Pyramid Valley on the South Island. This site, a large swamp, had become the graveyard of a vast number of moas and other birds. It's been estimated that in each acre of this site are preserved the remains of 800 birds. the last meal of a moa. Not grass, as used to be thought, but twigs, leaves, and seeds from its forest surroundings. And these are the gizzard stones which help to grind up its food. These are polished like gemstones. Each set of stones is all of one kind, suggesting that the moa didn't wander far in its search for food. Even articulated legs with plumage have survived. There were many moas smaller than the 10-foot giants, even down to the size of a turkey. This is a medium-sized species, as is this beautifully preserved head. The last of the moas may have survived almost to this century. One person believes she might have seen a moa in 1879. The two learners and even I came near it. And I got nearer and nearer until I sat down on the sand behind it. Her name was Mrs. Alice McKenzie. She recorded this story shortly before she died. I remember stroking its back and had no tail. It just lay there. It was quite quiet. So I put my hand underneath it and drew out one of its legs. And then we got up and uh, made a harsh grunting cry and bit at me. And I ran as hard as I could over the sand hills. I never looked behind, but the bird was gone. Birds can make a comeback. In 1849, it was Richard Owen again who described an extinct bird called the Takahe from fossil remains. No live bird was seen for a century. Then in 1948, it popped up again. The Takahe is a large flightless gallinule the size of a small turkey. The surviving Takahes live in a bleak valley, three to 4,000 feet above sea level, where few other birds can make a living. It's been shown that formerly they lived over the entire length of New Zealand and were hunted by the Maoris. Now they're restricted to this place, which has been named after them, Takahe Valley. Until winter drifts become too deep, the Takahe's chief food is the snow tussock. The technique is to pull out a blade with the large beak, hold it in the foot while discarding the dead outer leaves, and finally nip off the juicy end, the most nourishing part of the plant. Takahe's are faithful to their partner and their place. Throughout their lives, they will remain with the same mate and the same special part of this remote valley will be their home. And this slim down version of a Takahe is the Pukeko, or swamp hen. The Pukeko bears many obvious resemblances to the Takahe. It even uses its foot in a similar way. But it's a relatively recent arrival in New Zealand from Australia and gives a textbook example of the road to flightlessness. The Pukeko, with only a short career of island isolation, is already a labored and clumsy flyer, but nevertheless, it can get about quite efficiently. 
By contrast, the Takahe, a long-term New Zealand resident, is totally flightless and endangered. Confined to a single area of 200 square miles, its numbers are sinking steadily. Competing for food with introduced deer and preyed upon by stoats, there are only 150 left. Only the most urgent conservation measures can save it. But not all New Zealand flightless birds are in danger. Paradoxically, the weka, another flightless rail, has made itself very much at home. It's known for being inquisitive, cheeky, a snapper-up of unconsidered trifles, especially if they're bright and shiny. Teaspoons are a specialty. When opportunity offers, the weka raids garbage cans, digs up potatoes, and steals hen's eggs by sticking its long bill into the shell and running off with them. It's an aggressive and gluttonous bird. Wekas are even known to attack rats, which have been responsible for wiping out other island birds. The weka has had its ups and downs, but an opportunist like this must surely succeed. The hedgehog is now very common in New Zealand, having been introduced from Britain. But originally, New Zealand had no land mammals at all, except two species of bat. The roles of the missing mammals were taken by birds, and the hedgehog role was played by the kiwi. They have much in common. The kiwi, too, is a forest dweller. Its eyesight is poor. It's largely nocturnal and its food consists of soil animals which it finds by probing deeply into the earth. It's hard to imagine that the kiwi may be the only surviving relative of the world's tallest bird, the moa. The kiwi sees the world through its bill. It has an acute sense of smell, rare among birds. Its nostrils are under the tip of the bill, so they don't get clogged with earth. It can run surprisingly fast and is well known for its vicious kick. When it sleeps, the kiwi still attempts to tuck its head under its wing like a flying bird. The wing is that little tuft of feathers to the right of its head. Each individual seems to prefer to use either the left or the right wing, not both. The kiwi's only weakness is its fragile sternum, the breastbone. If grabbed by a dog, it can easily be crushed. Breeding is such a demanding activity for the kiwi that it requires long-term cooperation between the pair. The egg is laid in an underground burrow and incubated exclusively by the male. He builds up special reserves of fat for his vigil. The female has had a particularly uncomfortable pregnancy and plays no part in the incubation. The egg she has just produced is at least 20% of her body weight, probably the largest egg to adult ratio of any bird. During incubation, the egg is never turned as birds' eggs usually are. Normally, this would cause the membrane to adhere to the shell and prevent the chick from moving about inside. But a kiwi embryo is so active that three weeks before hatching, it can rock its egg to and fro. Most chicks have an egg tooth to help them break open the shell, but not the kiwi. It has to heave and stretch to struggle out of the egg. After being sealed in for so long, it often tends to run out of air before it can escape. The father's 70 days in the burrow have cost him 30% of his body weight. This unlikely baby is in some ways very advanced, in other ways quite helpless. For the first few days, it's not fed by its parents. It's nourished by a large yolk sac under its stomach. The plumage of the chick is more like hair than feathers, but so is that of the adult. The temperature of a kiwi and that of its egg 
is significantly lower than that of other birds. In these and many other ways, the kiwi is really more like a mammal than a bird. When it finally emerges, the chick is still not fed. It follows its parents around and learns from them. Communication between father and child is almost solely by smell through the sensitive beak. But the strangest, the most mysterious of New Zealand's many birds of paradox lies hidden like a fairy princess deep in the forest. This is the kakapo. Its name means night parrot. It's the world's largest parrot and totally incapable of flight. It's a placid bird, feeding mostly by night on fruits, flowers, and vegetation. It's an ancient species, friendly and confiding, laying small clutches and long-lived, probably as long as man. But that was before the introduction of cats. The kakapo has reached the edge of extinction, for many years, only a small number of birds were known on the mainland, and those only males. No females had been seen for 70 years. But then, in 1977, a new population was found on Stewart Island, off the southern tip of New Zealand. Here, the kakapo still carries out its strange rituals. As night falls, the males assemble in their display area, a series of shallow depressions on the ground linked by well-worn tracks. Each male settles into his bow and prepares himself to deliver one of the strangest songs in the bird world. echoes over the moist forests of Stewart Island. And the males don't call in vain, for here at last a few females have been found, one of which has a nest deep under the roots of a tree. And in the nest, one of the rarest birds in the world, a baby kakapo, the first chick to be seen for a hundred years. mother, meanwhile, is away gathering food. She plods as much as three miles each night to reach trees bearing the fruits she needs. But even on this island, the kakapo is at risk. So much of its life is spent on the ground. Its tracks can be easily followed. It smells sweetly of freesias. It's trusting and placid. Of all the kakapos discovered and recorded by scientists, each year, nearly 60% are killed by cats and other introduced mammals. Like many threatened species, these gentle birds of paradox may be the last of their kind.
next on 11, a sensitive look at a beleaguered minority group. Stay tuned for The Little People. Next week, nature explores a remarkable third kingdom of life that's neither plant nor animal. It's the strange world of the fungi, those agents of putrefaction and decay that are absolutely essential to life on our planet. Join us next week for a fascinating and beautiful film, Fungi, The Rotten World About Us. <laughs>